guys, it's Cupcake Kamisama back here and welcome to another video. For once, not an Alita fashion related one. But I won't be straying too far from it. I will stay in the weeby territory by giving you my personal ranking of all the Studio Ghibli films. And when I say all, I mean all. Those of you who may have me as your friend on Facebook may have seen this in the form of a very lengthy status that was recently updated but truth be told facebook is not the best place for rankings like this so instead i am adding a few final updates and putting it on youtube because this is the internet i have opinions and i will share them whether you are interested or not for my own release more than anything else because that's how the internet works right but before I do that, although this isn't my usual kind of content, I would nonetheless like to encourage you to subscribe to my channel, where I tend to discuss Lolita fashion related things. Although, if this video does well, who knows, I could look into making more like it. Whilst I publish one video a month, these days I often manage to make more than that, so if you don't want to miss out on those, make sure to click the bell button next to the subscribe one. And now, on to the ranking. By way of a preface, please note that all of these opinions are my own, they are highly subjective, and are based on the last time I've seen these films, in case of those I have seen before. This ranking started after Studio Ghibli filmography was added to Netflix starting in February of 2020, though this video also includes films that have not been part of that for reasons that I will specify for the individual titles. For additional context, I watched all of these films in Japanese, and even where I have seen a dubbed version before, that was not part of what formed my opinion on each of them. Where I haven't seen a film before and hadn't read about it previously, I aimed not to check things such as synopses to allow me to approach each film as open-minded as possible. There should be no major spoilers, but there may be some minor ones phrased in a general sort of way. So if you've not seen the film, it's safest to skip that. Unless, of course, you don't mind vague spoilers. And I will, of course, highlight where any significant spoilers may appear. There are 24 films to discuss and rank in total, plus an honourable mention, so let's get right to it. 24. The Wind Rises This is genuinely the only Ghibli film I struggled with. It was hard to detach the story from its historical context, and for all the creator's attempts to make us sympathise with the protagonist as simply someone with a dream, given what his work has led to, meant that the film felt like it was trying to glorify something that really should not be looked at with any degree of sympathy at all. Especially when you compare it to the other two Ghibli films discussing war, which had distinctly different attitudes towards the subject, and both of them condemned war as wrong, be it through tragedy or satire. And in contrast to Graver Fireflies in particular, The Wind Rises feels almost inappropriate. As such, it's the only film that I actually did not enjoy. It's not objectively a bad film. The standard of animation and production is just as high as all other Studio Ghibli films. It's simply the approach to the subject that did not sit well with me. The only people I could imagine claiming to love The Wind Rises would be those without much knowledge of World War II and or incredibly naive. I don't regret watching it, but having watched it, I wouldn't have anything to regret had I decided to skip it. If you have not seen this film, I would advise you to either ignore it or to do some reading either before or after watching it. I will leave a link in the description to a good article that you can start your reading with and decide for yourself. 23. The Red Turtle Okay, this is actually co-produced by Studio Ghibli rather than fully their own, which in part explains the low score. Also, fun fact! The son of the director was two years my senior at university and we had the same host family during our first year stay in Japan. So in the unlikely event that either of them ever find this video, please don't take my opinion personally. 
Let's start with what I liked, which is the visuals. They are more European animation than Japanese, which shows, though both the animation itself and the style and composition are beautiful. The music adds to it and overall the Red Turtle is a great sort of study of emotions and how to portray them without words, which leads to the grey area. The film being told entirely without dialogue is an interesting choice, positive in that it really focuses on those emotions and their universality that transcends language, but negative in the context of the plot, or maybe rather the main character, or oh, both actually. Because who would I like some words so that this man could explain himself? I was not prepared to witness violence towards an animal. Yes, I can see why the character would commit it, but that doesn't mean that it was right or even necessary. There was a way to achieve the same result without resorting to violence. And I do not understand the Red Turtle's behaviour towards the protagonist following that. It all felt a little bit, I don't know, gratuitous towards the man? As if the Red Turtle exists solely to support his character development. And as soon as he's out of the picture, she's also like, well, my job here is done, time to go back. Some of the plot bits, if I can even call them plot, just mm, don't make much sense to me. After the violent act mentioned earlier, I stopped being able to relate to the characters much and no amount of beautiful music or visuals could change my mind. The crabs were the absolute star of the show, but they are your typical background character, you know, QC sidekick. Not enough to rescue the film in my eyes, but just about enough to pull it out of the last spot. Though, given the array of award nominations, as well as actual awards, maybe I just didn't get the Red Turtle, which is also likely. If you're going to try to find out for yourself, be warned that the film depicts an act of violence towards an animal. Maybe it's easier to enjoy if you anticipate that. I don't know. Tell me in the comments. 22. Pompoko. It may seem like a harsh rating. It was second to last on this list before I saw The Red Turtle. So let me preface this by saying that this is a fun film. In the context of like animated films in general, this would likely rank higher. However, other Studio Ghibli films have had a much more significant impact on me, and I just enjoyed them a lot more. To me, Pompoko would be improved if it was a bit shorter. I don't think that this particular story needs two hours to be told, and there were bits that felt like they dragged. Having said this, I appreciate how bizarre it gets at times. It made me laugh here and there, and I applaud the animators for having balls to draw balls on the male tanuki. It was certainly a choice which only history can judge. 21. Ocean Waves In what I call Studio Ghibli Tries Teen Romance Trilogy, this may be the first by release date, but it's my least favourite of the lot. Based on my ranking, it seems that Ghibli has improved over time with this mini-genre, but first stab at it really missed the mark for me. I completely could not understand what any of the characters saw in the heroine, neither the male protagonist nor his best friend, considering how manipulative and selfish she was. By the time her backstory unfolded, it was too late for me to find any sympathy for her, particularly as we didn't see much character development from her until pretty much the end, where in turn the positive changes were more implied than stated. And while at first I could feel sorry for the hero for, you know, continuing to try to do the right thing with her and the right thing for her and getting burned instead, there is only so much of this I could watch before concluding that he was an idiot who should have given up. I mean, not that anyone's a genius when navigating social relationships when puberty hormones rage, but I could not find any believable reason for Taku to keep trying and or agreeing instead of just leaving her to deal with her shit herself. There was just too much frustration with how every character behaved for me to enjoy it, though at least it evoked some sort of 
an emotional response, even if that was mainly rolling my eyes at them all. But better that the indifference, right? 20. Laputa, Castle in the Sky. This one was hard to approach afresh because when I first watched it, I wasn't a fan. I gave it my best shot the second time round, and I came out of it with an appreciation for what this film is, and that is a good piece of adventure aimed at younger kids. I can see its appeal, I can see why someone might like it, and the characters became a bit more fleshed out and believable for me. But on an emotional level, I just could not get into it. However, the visuals are stunning, the titular castle in the sky looks simply magical, and I admire that a lot. I'd probably tie it with Ponyo, actually, but if I really had to avoid ties, then I guess Ponyo fares a smidge better because it was shorter. Which leads to 19 Ponyo. As you will find out throughout this video, the films aimed at younger kids are not for me is a bit of a running theme. I remember watching it for the first time in English, where Liam Neeson's and Kate Blanchett's voice acting worked so well with the characters. In Japanese, I think I lost that connection a bit. And while this hasn't impacted my enjoyment of their overall story, there was one part where I felt like the English dubbing worked in the story's favour. I find it more believable that the spell that kept Ponyo a human would work with a five-year-old promising to love her than with a five-year-old making promises of Aisuru. Aisuru has much more gravitas to it, which I don't think a child could comprehend beyond maybe loving a parent. However, I can totally believe that a child could earnestly talk about loving because that verb is used so commonly in the English language that it's not necessarily restricted to declarations of undying affection that will last through lifetimes. The ending just works better for me in English than it does in Japanese, but we're talking literally a couple of lines here. For the rest of it, it's some light-hearted family entertainment, which is nice to watch, but doesn't give me the gratification that would make me rank this higher. 18. The Cat Returns Now this was one bizarre film. The premise was quite ridiculous to begin with and it seems to have only gotten wilder as the film progressed. It was very enjoyable and pretty funny at times. Maybe just a bit too crazy for me to want to revisit it. It's good entertainment though more of a one-off for me. Do give it a go though if you enjoy wacky stuff. 17. Porco Rosso. Although I wasn't quite sure what to expect of this one, my expectations were set pretty low. So I was really pleasantly surprised at the film and at how much I enjoyed it. This is another one of Studio Ghibli's bizarre and weird films rather than the wistful, nostalgic, emotional kind, but it works. A man cursed with being a pig who's a bounty hunter and one of the best pilots during World War I. I mean, just saying that sounds bonkers, but I have found myself enjoying it so much more than I ever anticipated. Maybe not to the extent where I'd choose to watch Porco Rosso again. Then again, it's not completely improbable. Though more likely it's a, uh, I'd stop to watch this if it was on TV and I was already flicking channels kind of scenario. 16. Whisper of the Heart the second of Studio Ghibli does teen romance trilogy in both release date and my own ranking. To be completely honest, I liked it, all the way until the very end. And sadly, that ending felt so ridiculously over the top for me that it really prevented me from enjoying the story as a whole. It is literally one line, but it felt so unbelievable for 14 year olds to say it that it spoilt the film for me. Everything up until then was fun, I liked how the connection between the characters developed, and I could relate to Shizuku on a more personal level, having also done a lot of bad lyrics translations, and loving books, and writing my own creative fiction. Although, she was a bit annoying in her relationships with her family, so I can't say that I wholeheartedly rooted for her, but it wasn't bad enough for me to dislike her. Just enough for me to roll my eyes at her sometimes. Bonus point for references to another Studio Ghibli film in there and big appreciation for the film making all of us fall in love with that particular rendition of Take Me Home Country Roads. 
honestly if you find the olivia newton johns one on youtube at least half the comments will mention whisper of the heart or studio ghibli just go and find out for yourself it's just that one damn line genuinely if it wasn't for that this film would have ranked so much higher 15 arietti you know i almost don't know what to say it's easy to say why you love the film or why it annoyed you but when you get to the middle ones it all blends into a bit of a meh thing no meh isn't the right way to describe it because it's still studio ghibli we're talking about here so it's never truly meh it's more so that there was nothing in Arietti that I would have fallen in love with personally, but also nothing that I hated. It's a good film. It delivers everything we love about Studio Ghibli productions in terms of characters, animation, setting, music, and the feels. It's cozy and homely, a fantastic family film, particularly for the younger audiences. There just wasn't much else in there that would have resonated with me. Maybe had the borrowers been a part of my childhood, I would have felt differently. There likely would have been some nostalgia element from my own life, like with another film that you'll see higher up in the ranking. But that's not an experience that I had. Again, I'd stop to watch it if it was on TV and I was already flicking channels, but that's about it. 14. Kiki's Delivery Service Similarly to Arietti, I can't necessarily say anything against Kiki's Delivery Service. It's simply that it's aimed at a younger audience, which means executing the story in a way that I'm not necessarily quite keen on. It's cute and charming. Watching Kiki find her place and her people was genuinely lovely, and I appreciate how the film didn't shy away from showing her struggle, showing her dealing with doubts and hinting at depression. These are messages that younger audiences absolutely should see as this will help them navigate growing up better. And I can't not love Gigi. I mean, all kitties are love and black kitties are extra love. In all fairness, Gigi is kind of the reason why I want to like this film a lot more than I actually do. This was one that I had seen before and approached it again determined to like it more, which I guess I did in comparison to the first viewing. But to me, it simply lost out to some of the other films. 13. Earwig and the Witch Oof. Now, watch me get crucified for daring to rank Earwig and the Witch so highly while scoring some of the absolute Ghibli classics so much lower. The 2020 digitally animated TV release did not come into this world showered with praise. It struggles with reviews and it struggled as soon as the trailers hit because it was just not what people expected from Studio Ghibli. But I do genuinely like it. It was a fun film, I had a good time watching it. I can definitely imagine myself re-watching it out of my own volition. Of all the films aimed at the younger audiences, I really enjoyed it, particularly plot-wise. But that's more thanks to it being based on a Diana Wynne-Jones novel. Yes, the computer animation was a bit clunky sometimes, but I feel like if you look at it as a film made for TV first, and then as a Ghibli film, it's easier to look past that. And I feel that with a bigger budget like Studio Ghibli has for their cinema releases, they could find a way to blend their art style with computer animation techniques more seamlessly. Because it was really easy to imagine how this film would look like in a traditional drawing style, which does drive in the point that it would have hit better had it been drawn that way. But it also suggests to me that with more money to dedicate to that, they could really nail it. Remember when everyone thought that Disney would lose its magic when they started doing computer animated films? I believe Tangled was the first one of them. And yet, they managed to deliver one banger after another? Studio Ghibli could do that too, if only they allowed themselves that room to experiment and explore. So I say do give Ewig and a Witch a chance, and come at it as open-minded as you can. If you like the background vibe of Howl's Moving Castle and want it more English and more for kids, you'll like this one. Especially, especially if you find a way to look past this style of animation. 12. Nausicaa and the Valley of the Wind Okay, technically, this film was made before Studio Ghibli officially became Studio Ghibli. But if I'm including Grave of Fireflies in this list, 
which is a Studio Ghibli film, yet which wasn't added to Netflix because another company holds the rights to it, then I can't skip on this for such a minor technicality. I actually had one unsuccessful attempt at watching Nausicaa years back, but then I stopped because my expectations were very different from what I saw on screen. Now that I've watched it in full, I'm matured and grown up myself. I'm glad to have given it a second chance because it is a wonderful film. The themes and characters are so much like the other Studio Ghibli films I enjoy, so why is it so much lower? I can't quite put my finger on the why, but in short, I struggled to connect to it emotionally as much as I did to the other films. I admire what Nausicaa as a character represents, which is female empowerment and being the heroine that doesn't need a hero to save the day. She can do so with kindness as well as strength. The whole setting is so surreal and full of creatures that lurk in the darkest parts of our imagination. And it also has that 1980s vibe that animated films had back then. You know, the one that's like, shit gets very dark and very real before the happy end to make that ending feel truly earned and more like light at the end of the storm. But I think that in the end the film spread itself a little bit too thin with the minor plots and ended up lacking the depth that would have helped me connect with it more. I thoroughly enjoyed watching it, just didn't connect with Nausicaa in the same way as I do with other Studio Ghibli heroines. And I don't feel like the film explored the themes of human exploitation of nature, as well as some of their other ones. Even Pompoko fared better in that regard, in my opinion. Every studio and storyteller starts somewhere, so both Miyazaki Hayao and Studio Ghibli should be incredibly proud that this is where their journey started though. It's a great film to launch a studio with, even though it technically didn't. 11. Tales of Earthsea I remember the excitement I felt when I discovered this film, Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea books have been some of my favourites. I keep meaning to reread them and just not getting round to it. Hold me accountable to it someday. And they had a significant impact on me growing up. Studio Ghibli did the Earthsea universe justice, however I do feel like those unfamiliar with the books would find it hard or harder to get into. It's not necessarily that the film strictly or directly follows any of the books, at least not that I remember. But a lot is assumed about the viewer's understanding of the world and catching the references to Le Guin's work. As such, I feel like on its own, to someone who hasn't read the books, this film would seem like your typical high fantasy story of fighting evil. And while some bits of it were simplified and lacked nuance, this was always going to be a challenge when compressing a universe that consists of a few novels and several short stories into a film that's just under two hours long. In other words, if this were an objective review, Tales of Earthsea would be ranked much lower. However, this is a subjective one. The Earthsea stories are dear to me and this film, with all its imperfections, is special to me too, evoking some true nostalgia for the young teen and preteen that I was. And the music! <sighs> I can't even think of it without tearing up with emotions. Studio Ghibli films always have absolutely perfect soundtrack, but this one beats them all for me and I remember listening to it on repeat for so long, I might need to put it on as soon as I'm done. Before we get to my top 10, I would like to briefly pause for an honourable mention that is The Little Norse Prince, aka Horus the Prince of the Sun. Just like Nausicaa, it predates the creation of Studio Ghibli, though this time by much more as it's a film from 1968. And so I felt that putting a ranking to it would be somewhat unfair, because this film has aged, noticeably. There are moments of wonderful animation and some lovely storytelling, but watching it from the 2020s, it was hard not to notice some of the dated dialogues and bits. And whilst I could see how this is also a production that needed to happen to allow Studio Ghibli animators the growth to become what they are now, it is much further from the standard that we expect of them now, which is also why this is only an honourable mention rather than a rank. Having said this, whilst the film is obviously aimed at younger children, it manages to include a fair bit of nuance in there. 
It could have easily been a one-dimensional good versus evil story, and it wasn't. It deserves a recommendation with the caveat that you watch it prepared for a late 60s film. Don't judge it through the lens of what Studio Ghibli is now, but as a piece of work that needed to happen in order for Studio Ghibli to be created in the first place. Okay, back to the ranking and going straight to number 10 with My Neighbor Totoro. I know, it's a classic, I know, don't kill me. Yes, the film is cute and escaping Totoro merchandise is nigh impossible. I also completely love the characters. The relationship between the sisters is warm yet layered. It's not all cuteness and happiness, but it's also not constant bickering and hatred. They both express their emotions in ways that are clear where they came from. And bonus points for how the film dealt with the mother's storyline. It would have been so easy to take it to either extreme, underplay it or overplay it. But in my opinion, it kept it at the level it needed to be to remain realistic, whilst also easy to digest for the younger audiences. Because that is the key phrase that we're coming back to that makes me rank this film so much lower. It's intended for younger audiences. I enjoy it but it's not something that I would feel the need to return to on any kind of basis. It's fantastic, and I would recommend it to people of all ages, both parents and non-parents, anyone who enjoys animated films. As you will have noticed by now, Studio Ghibli's younger films are simply not my cup of tea. And as you will find out from my top picks, I really do prefer those aimed at least at teens. Having said this, if I ever hear Sampo, then of course I'll join in the singing, and you can pry my Totoro merge out of my cold, dead fingers. Number 9 from Up on Poppy Hill. And finally, my favourite in the Studio Ghibli Tries Teen Romance Trilogy. Let it be noted here that in my opinion, Ghibli should try to avoid doing teen romance. Despite the clear improvement over the years, I don't find any of them particularly believable. And I love me some teen romance films as a genre, so I've seen even more wildly unrealistic stuff elsewhere. Studio Ghibli is simply better at creating stories with deeper meaning or ones that empower their female protagonists. And the teen romance ones, in my opinion, fall flat in comparison to the rest of their works. Still, Within that mini genre, this is my favourite. Yes, it still gets a little too unbelievable, almost in a telenovela way, in how two teens living in a major port city hub are somehow that closely connected, though I can sort of see it happening. Again, teen romance genre got me used to wilder stuff. Though there is some very strong bias on my part, because as soon as I realised that Ue o Muite Aruko, one of my favorite songs ever features in this film our salt i will unconditionally love from up on poppy hill just for that it's also one of two films that i remember coming out in cinemas whilst i was in japan myself this time whilst i was on my first ever visit there at that point my japanese language skills would not have been enough to follow so i never went to see it then and then kind of forgot to watch it until it came to netflix during my second study abroad trip, I also remember seeing flyers for some film-based tours of Yokohama where the story is set. And not gonna lie, the very idea of this existing just makes me smile. Whilst you can't feel nostalgic for times you've never lived in, I mean, hell, my parents weren't even born in the year the film is set. And Japan had its own problems to deal with. Studio Ghibli evokes nostalgia like no one else and makes you feel like, what a wonderfully happy time this must have been. I guess this is kind of the point of first school love type of stories anyway. Not much place for wider socio-political discussions within that, but still, you get my drift. Number eight, My Neighbors de Yamadas. First of all, I have very good memories associated with this film because a copy of it was first gifted to me by a very, very good family friend. Because of that personal backstory, it evokes some really homely, cosy feelings inside of my heart. And then the film itself is hilariously cosy and homely. I thoroughly enjoy slice of life things like this. You know, funny glimpses that we know families deal with. Not every family story has to be some life-changing drama. The day-to-day -day chaos of minor problems, small mistakes and tiny rituals 
is enough to make for very fun viewing and very wholesome viewing. The creators proved to have excellent observation skills of very inspirational family lives and they made their mother as a family that we all know and love despite their apparent ineptitude to deal with daily life. This is fantastic for some pick-me-up viewing, particularly thanks to being made up of multiple shorter stories rather than following a main plot arc. So you can start watching, pause it after one of those episodes, then come back to it when you next feel like it. Really easy watching. 7. Only Yesterday A film that took me by surprise. The time jumps felt odd at first, particularly as they didn't seem to connect much in terms of the plot. But as soon as I realised that this is more of a character sketch than a plot-based story, it really allowed me to enjoy it to the fullest. You can almost treat the glimpses of the past as individual scenes, kind of like with My Neighbours the Amadas. And for its cheesiness, the romantic arc appealed to me because of how dorky both characters were. Maybe it's because they were both adults and the creators didn't feel the need to over-dramatise the arc. Whatever the reason, seeing them fumble when navigating romantic attempts felt more realistic than the heartfelt declarations shouted by teenagers in anime. It was just adorable, adorkable, and made me root for them both. As always, Studio Ghibli doesn't skimp on glamorizing country life and really makes you yearn for living in a traditional wooden house where you'd overlook the richly green rice paddies every day. It's a picture-perfect image that is wonderful to hang on your wall and, at least in the context of Only Yesterday, you can live it through the protagonist and her choices. 6. Grave of Fireflies I've seen all of the Studio Ghibli films that were added to Netflix by the time I got round to this one. Partly because I had to source it from elsewhere, but mainly because I procrastinated. Having been warned several times by basically everyone who's seen it, I knew that I had to be prepared to make that emotional investment. Side note, I'm a crier at films. The tiniest and dumbest things set me off so I worked myself up for watching this one for probably a little bit too long. While I'm glad that I took the time to ensure that I was truly ready to watch Grave of Fireflies, once I finally have, I felt a little bit silly for putting it off for so long. Not because the warnings were wrong, hell no! More so because the story feels like one of those everyone ought to watch at least once. I think what makes the already sad story more heart-wrenching is the soft animation used to tell it. The juxtaposition between the innocence of childhood and the brutal realities of war make for difficult watching regardless of medium, yet somehow dressing that in beautiful animation which we associate with carefree stories of our childhood and is innocent nostalgia just acts like a stab in the back. Even though Grave of Fireflies doesn't even bother with building any pretense to mislead you, from the get-go it straight up tells you that this story is not for the faint-hearted. This also reminds me of that spirit of western animations from the 1980s. Shit gets very dark and very real here, but at least the film has the decency to tell you that in the first few minutes, tell you how it will end so that you can stop deluding yourself before getting too emotionally invested which you still will. But that is a direction that as a crier I very highly respect since I'm not always in the mood to be unexpectedly hit hard in the feels. Even though in this case I 110% expected to be hit hard in the feels. As should you, if you are yet to watch this for the first time. 5. Spirited Away Just like with My Neighbor Totoro, I'm kind of expecting backlash because I know that this is a classic. I know. And I agree. I mean it didn't win an Oscar for nothing. I have seen Spirited Away before and re-watched it once it got to Netflix and I still enjoy it just as much. The film ages really well, not losing any of its magic or wonder and it's one of those where each viewing uncovers another layer to it that I had missed before. Yes, the story of a girl who is forced to deal with shit and be the hero she never wanted to be is still important because girls do so much more than twirl in pretty dresses and scream for boys to help them. Girls are more than capable 
of rolling up their sleeves and doing the right thing, even though the right thing might terrify them or gross them out. For that reason, Spirited Away will always remain a very important film, not just an animated one, for years to come. I can't help but love it, just not as much as I love the other ones. 4. When Marnie Was There This is the one that knocked Spirited Away from the top 4 spot. And believe me, it wasn't a straightforward decision. I had to seriously and carefully ponder this first. In the end, I decided to put it above Spirited Away simply because this particular story won my heart more. I thoroughly enjoyed the way that the protagonist's backstory unfolded. Maybe it's just me, but it really took me until the end to connect the pieces. It's also probably because for too much of the film, I just sat there and nodded with approval at Studio Ghibli giving us the sapphic love story we all wanted. And considering how it does end, this feels like a very wrong thought to have. But let's face it, we would have happily seen it be that instead, right? As we've already established, Studio Ghibli has a tendency to really romanticise the countryside. But I am glad that in doing so, it shows a different part of Japan each time. Hokkaido has a very special place in my heart, and though I never got to see Kushiro in those areas in the summer, even if it was just as magical at the end of February, I can picture everything just as clearly. Together with the fact that I distinctly remember watching the trailer for this film over and over again on screens when riding buses in Kanazawa in summer towards the end of my study abroad trip, this film has become a firm favourite that I feel I will definitely revisit in the future. 3. The Tale of Princess Kaguya Oh boy, I was not prepared for this emotional roller coaster. Which, to be honest, only speaks of how little classical Japanese literature I covered at and retained from university. Sorry to my teachers if they're watching, which they're probably not. I was aware of Taketori Monogatari and had a rough idea of what happened, but I never read it in full, just the excerpts that we practiced translating for our exams. So my knowledge of the plot was quite dry, to put it kindly. Having read up about the film afterwards, the creators did breathe more life and relatability into the protagonist, which would be what turned this into such an emotional ride. And I for one am grateful that they did because it made for a very impactful film. The worry with taking a piece of classical literature was that the story would feel too much like a costume drama. You know, the sort of yeah, people are still people, but we don't act like this nowadays. Reactions that you might have caught yourself having at Downton Abbey or something like that. But at its core, The Tale of Princess Kaguya feels very much like it could still be about so many young girls today. Her emotions and reactions resonated with me and I wished for her to find happiness. The style of drawing worked beautifully with the story too, evoking paintings of Heian women without feeling dated and adding so much movement to the film, making scenes dynamic even when there wasn't much movement happening on screen. Beautiful, beautiful film, and I would love for Studio Ghibli to do more works like this, whether it be other pieces of classical Japanese literature, or simply more of this style of animation because I honestly live for those visuals. And if this video isn't proof enough of how much I love this film, when Studio Ghibli released high-res stills from their films for free downloads, I had one from this film printed on a big poster that is currently hanging in my bedroom. That and the painting by Lou Graves are the only pieces of art that I look at before falling asleep and I shall not have it any other way. At number two is... Dum, 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 House Moving Castle! I thought long and hard about this. Up until watching everything as it's been added to Netflix, House Moving Castle held the top spot jointly with the film that I now decided is my actual number one. And the tale of Princess Kaguya really did give House Moving Castle a run for its money. So it wasn't even an obvious second place, as I certainly imagined before I started watching everything. What kept How's Moving Castle at number two for me was the fact that, as a more light-hearted story, I am much more likely to revisit it than I am The Tale of Princess Kaguya. I appreciate the deeper 
less happy stories for the messages that they carry and the emotions that they evoke but i enjoy my cinematic entertainment on the lighter side and like films that make me feel happy and help escape the overwhelming reality when it's not so cheerful this is also the only film where i severely hesitated before watching it in japanese because i love the english dubbing so much and i'll be the first to admit that I may have come out of it liking the Japanese even more. Don't get me wrong, I still love the English dubbing. The whole cast did a magnificent job. Christian Bale, Christian Bale brought Hal to life for me and that version has a very special place in my heart. It's not even that the original Japanese voices are better, more so that the dialogues themselves are better. Translators have to make choices. And to localize a film well means that you will deviate from the original so that the translation can sound natural to your audience. To me, in the context of the various scenes and characters, there were moments that simply felt more natural and made more sense in Japanese than they did in English. For example, Sophie's encounter with the soldiers early on in the film. Again, this is not a criticism of the job the translators did on the English version. That is stellar work. It's merely how I felt about them as someone who is in the position to compare. And while I know that book howl and film howl are two different howls, the film howl still has a big chunk of my heart with them. That was a lot of howls. Which means that finally at number one, my all time favorite Studio Ghibli film ever is Princess Mononoke. As already mentioned, this was an intense brainstorm to decide which film deserved the number one spot the most. In the end, Princess Mononoke emerged victorious and unless Studio Ghibli produces something else as breathtakingly and heartakingly moving, it's likely to remain there for some years to come. Sure, there is a degree of bias here. This is the very first Studio Ghibli film that I ever became aware of and the first one that I have ever watched. However, despite being 24 years old now, the film stands the test of time and its message just as relevant now as then, if not more so. Each individual component, as well as the entirety of the film, creates a magic that I find as captivating as I did when I first watched it. And although these days I probably would have liked the ending to have been a little bit different, in my view probably a touch more realistic, I appreciate that there are certain limitations on these things due to the film's intended audience and the restrictions that come with that. And that is it! My own personal and subjective ranking of every single Studio Ghibli film that has been released to date, including some that are only partially Studio Ghibli, or ones that predate the formation of the studio. I have no doubts that my opinions may have ruffled some feathers out there, so whilst the gustibus non disputandum est, or tastes should not be disputed, I invite you to share your opinions and your favourites with me in the comments. From past experience of releasing this list initially on Facebook, I also know that there are still many people out there who do not realise the full filmography of Studio Ghibli, so I'm curious to hear which of these films are ones that maybe you haven't heard of prior to watching this video. Let me know in the comments and make sure to give this video a thumbs up if you have enjoyed it. It will let me know to do more things like it and it will let YouTube know that this is the sort of content that you enjoy. If you haven't yet, I would love it if you subscribed to my channel because whilst my content and the promise of one video a month are Lolita fashion related, if I do upload anything that's not that, you'll know that first if you subscribe and click the bell icon next to it. You can also support me by either leaving a tip via coffee or by joining my Patreon where the $2 a month tier will grant you one week early access to every single video that I upload, whether it be Lolita fashion related or not. And for those who do want more Lolita fashion content, I encourage you to check out my blog, which is Cupcakes and Unicorns, where I keep most of that sort of stuff. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Take care. Bye.